So I was, uh, you know how I feel about uh, what's going on with the government right now. And my big hopes right now is that Donnie Tynahan's Trump put such an ugly face on the stuff our government's been doing all along that half the left that has fallen asleep under the Democratic leadership of Barack Obama will wake up and uh, start opposing the horrible stuff that both parties have been doing. And I came across an article in Common Dreams, uh, and it says, which part of the 1930s did you not get? Americans finally learned to cooperate on a national suicide project. And it was written by Professor David Michael Green, uh, who... Uh, who's a political science professor at Hofstra University in New York. And uh, we have him on the phone. Uh, professor, how are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me on the show, Jimmy. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you. I just want to read a little bit of what you wrote, and then we can talk about it. He said, right now we are witnessing enormous cooperation across the political spectrum in the great national project of destroying the republic. And thanks to such widespread support, I can report that it's going quite swimmingly indeed. I think the events of November 8th leave little doubt about that. First, Amer African American. So you went on in the article. So you, what a lot of people say is that American uh, politics are broken and they don't get to, they don't work together. So you kind of open your article by saying they actually are working together, but they're working together to ruin the republic. What do you mean by that? Well, it was a little tongue in cheek. I mean, I don't literally believe that they're working together. But as you know, from reading the piece, um, I, I lay equal blame on uh, Democratic actors, including, you know, Democratic supporters in the public uh, for what transpired as I do for Republicans. And so that was kind of that was kind of my way of introducing that theme. We can point fingers at Republicans. It's easy to do and it should be done. But I think um, liberals and Democrats have to look at uh, their own complic complicity in what transpired uh, in, in turning uh, Donald Trump into president of the United States as well. So what? Yeah. So what you say is so you go, you you make the case you you make the case that the GOP has been despicable uh, as far as going back like 30, 40, 50 years once the civil rights movement started after everybody got yeah. through the Great Depression and then people wanted their piece of the pie. You know, it was uh, African Americans, yeah. LGBT, women's rights. So, and then the and the GOP has has fought that tooth and nail every step of the way. And for that, you get you point your wag your finger at them, which everyone should. And you know, I, I think it's funny too that you know uh, you you didn't mention this. I don't remember in the article about the the Southern strategy, which was invented by Richard Nixon, which was just right. scaring white people about black people to get them to vote for Republicans. And so then when Trump happens, right. everybody's like, oh my God, the Republicans are racist. This this has been a policy that two out of the last three RNC chairmen have apologized for the Southern strategy. So you you really uh, accurately characterize the GOP as letting America down in that regard. But then you do shift to the Democrats and you say, meanwhile, the Democrats are as least as much to blame for the catastrophe of Trump as are Republicans, starting with Hillary Clinton herself. And you just put the greatest uh, framing around Hillary Clinton that I've seen in print so far. And I'm just let me read it to oh, the people. It says, in reality, Clinton was so morally compromised a candidate and so lacking any serious rationale for her candidacy other than her own self-aggrandizement as leaked documents revealed even the campaign couldn't figure out what their appeal was supposed to be that the only serious asset she brought to the campaign was having trump as her opponent and if you're so morally freighted a candidate that you can't even beat the guy with 16 built-in self-destruct buttons including being an admitted sexual predator who is tweeting out messages messages that chew through alienated groups as fast as his thumbs will allow you must be one hell of an abysmal candidate ladies and gel gentlemen may i introduce to you hillary rodham clinton so that was that that's a perfect so that is what everyone is missing in this discussion you know i saw howard dean on morning joe saying well the millennials didn't come out for her so he blames the millennials and people blame the african americans in detroit and milwaukee and people are blaming the so they're blaming jill stein and gary johnson voters and everybody pep nobody looks at the horribleness of that candidate, uh, exactly like you did. What, what do you say about it? Seems that the media is still uh, doing the same old thing. They're ignoring what you just said. Do you see that? 
I do. I think there's a lot of blame to go around. And I think if people are not looking at Hillary Clinton and, and probably even fewer are looking at Barack Obama, as you know, I indicted him in this article as well. We're going to get to if that. Not looking at. Yeah, OK, we, if we're if they're not looking at those two individuals and I think most Democrats are not. I mean, let's face it, most Democrats adore Bill Clinton. And, and as I noted uh, in the article, I, you know, I think you can compare Clinton to Ronald Reagan and George W. Bush and ask which one of those did the most damage to the economic welfare of middle class Americans. And the answer is Clinton. And yet Democrats still, you know, look at him in the same way they look at Kennedy, you know, as a, kind of this revered figure. So I think you see a lot of that going on with Obama, maybe a little less so with Hillary, but I don't think you find very many Democrats willing to say that, you know, this is an extremely flawed individual in terms of just basic human integrity who ran a, a basically crappy campaign that couldn't articulate a reason for anybody to get up off the sofa and go vote for her. And so, you know, there's a hell of a lot of blame to go around with um, Republicans. Trump is, you know, about the ugliest thing to come around in a century or so. And the Republican Party, as we were talking about earlier, have been absolutely uh, just abysmal in the way that they have um, – uh, have have mortgaged the lives and futures of, of so many people in order to win elections. There's a lot of blame to go around, but I think liberals again and Democrats, if they're if they're only looking at those parties and they're not looking at um, at uh, uh, fellow liberals and Demo or supposedly liberal uh, and, and Democrats who are complicit in this, they're they're missing a big part of the story, and they'll never get it right if they don't you know face that honestly. I, could, I couldn't agree with you more, and that's why I keep talking about this over and over, because it scares me to see the Democrats almost on purpose missing the lessons they're supposed to learn from losing to Donnie Tiny Hands Trump. And, yeah. you know, uh, just there was one thing that you said about uh, – here's what I was saying during the primary with Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton is like I re I'm old enough to remember the time when being for the Iraq war was a disqualifier. But now ignoring someone's support for the Iraq war seemed to be the progressive thing to do. And you addressed that in your article. You said Clinton also lost a lot of progressive supporters by voting for George W. Bush's Iraq war resolution as – as well she should have. In fact, she should count herself lucky that she's not sitting in some civil or criminal court or both to answer for that crime. The lie that she's offered in the form of some jive apology only compounds the sin of the original lie. So now somewhere between 100,000 and a million Iraqis, Americans and others are dead, all lives sacrificed on the altar of personal careers of American politicians like Bush, Kerry and Clinton. And then you say, which I love, you say again, please forgive my naivete, but I just don't know how somebody like that sleeps at night. To be honest, it seems to me that only a full blown sociopath could live with themselves, having traded so much human misery for their own pathetic career ambitions and uh you know i i couldn't agree more i don't understand how were you surprised to see how progressives completely uh apologized or just dismissed her support for the iraq war not to mention libya and she wanted a more muscular response in uh syria and uh, what she did in honduras but not but just the iraq war like to me that was a defining moment and uh, she pa failed that test, so that should have disqualified her. Are you still surprised to see that all the, the lefties who uh, apologized for her during the primary? I suppose so. I mean, I think it did cost her the nomination uh, in uh, 2008, but I think by the time you get to 2016, she's sort of the heir apparent for many Democrats in the party, and I don't think anybody really saw much of an alternative. And by the way, there isn't. I mean, think about what the Democratic bench is. It's zero. It's nothing. There's nobody. Uh, and whoever there is, you know, you look at maybe a few leaders, for example, in Congress, they're in their 70s, right, or pushing 80. Um, so th there kind of wasn't. And I think a lot of progressives maybe resigned themselves to the fact that there was only Clinton or Trump. And uh, number one, Clinton was a woman, so that's a good thing. And number two, she seems to be moving to the left during the primary, so that's a good thing. I mean, there was, of course, the Bernie Sanders campaign, but I don't think Bernie expected to win. I think that was really the fundamental flaw in his campaign. I, I think he ran sort of as a protest candidate and was probably very much surprised himself by how he caught fire and nearly did win. And I think ultimately he 
I think, was reluctant, and I partially blame him for this, and I partially understand, uh, to pull the trigger and really, you know, bring out the fangs and go after Clinton in the way you you probably would have needed to to win the nomination. And so your question's a good one, it, uh, but I think that maybe a lot of um, progressives were sort of resigned to you know, the lesser of evils when they were thinking about Clinton. But your your point is so well taken about her. I mean, she not only failed that test, but it wasn't sort of a judgment test. It was a moral test. I, and that's what I'm trying to get at. And this is the thing that astonish, astonishes me so much. I mean, we're horrified when one person dies, like, say, you know, a white cop shoots a, a black person who's running away from him. And we're rightly horrified by that. But imagine somebody so callous that they're willing to expend 100,000, 500,000, a million lives. And those are just the dead people. Forget about the ones who's, who are still alive, whose lives have been absolutely ruined. A million lives in order to advance their career, to put another notch on their resume. I really, it just astonishes me that we can look past that. It's almost like the way in which we sort of don't think about the possibility of nuclear holocaust. You know, maybe it's just too terrible to contemplate. But that's the greatest moral test of a politician, I think, that there is. And she, she absolutely, utterly failed it. And, you know, getting back to your earlier point, we, it, this is such a great point. You say, regrettably, liberals can be virtually as dogmatic and irrational as conservatives on these questions, and Clinton is Exhibit A. No one, Reagan, Bush Jr. included, did more harm to the American middle class and to the Democratic Party than did Clinton, for which they love him to this day. Now, this is what you were talking about before. Now, I make this point. I read the book Listen Liberal by Thomas Frank, and he makes the point that, you know, people always talk about voting for the lesser of two evils. Even Chomsky said that. This election, you have to vote against the greater evil. But, you know, people constantly get that wrong. Who's the greater evil? Because people thought that Bill Clinton was the lesser of two evils in 1992 and 1996. But let me tell you something. You and I both know it took a Democrat to decimate unions. It took a Democrat to repeal the New Deal banking legislation. It took a Democrat to gut welfare. It took a Democrat to explode the prison population. It took a Democrat to pass NAFTA. George Herbert Walker Bush couldn't even pass NAFTA. So all these things that Democrats were united against before Bill Clinton, now Bill Clinton became president. He's this neoliberal who turns his back on workers' unions, gets in bed with Wall Street and Silicon Valley, and then he starts to sell out his base, and he shifts the party. The party literally shifted from being a party of workers to a party of white-collar elites who live in suburban cul-de-sacs. Would you agree with that? Oh, yeah. I think uh, that was a a beautifully articulate way to state it. I mean, you absolutely nailed it. I mean, the only place I might depart from you slightly is I think if you're voting in November of 1992, you don't necessarily see that coming. And maybe even in November of 1996, there's still some hope. But but today, here we are in 2016, to revere Bill Clinton, as Democrats have been doing for the last several decades, is just you know, it's just a kind of astonishing act of, um, you know, f- faith-based politics, base- basically. You know, it's sort of like we always root for the Red Sox, and so we're always going to root for the Red Sox, you know. He's a Democrat. Uh, he says nice things. He gives a good speech. He makes us feel good in our bones. Um, not recognizing all the things that you listed, and that was a hell of a good indictment. I mean, that's exactly what happened, and there's more that we could add to that list, including things that he didn't do that he should have done. Um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, he, he, he destroyed, I think, the middle class more than any political figure I can think of in my lifetime, and he destroyed the Democratic Party in exactly the way you mentioned. I mean, he is the guy who turned the party into the new Democratic Party, which is just a polite way of saying – you know, sort of a Republican Party without the social uh, baggage and, you know, without the kind of um, nasty rhetoric. And so do you uh, think basically do you think the people who basically sub- is the exact equivalent of Tony Blair in Britain? And the only difference is, for some reason, Labor Party members in Britain understand that and they dis- they're disgusted by Blair. Democrats in America haven't figured that out. Uh, well, it seems like half of them have and half of them haven't. Isn't that? And, and I think the the problem is that what, what in America people look to their um, you know liberal leaders or their lefty 
uh, leaders in the media, like MSNBC, for instance, or people at Mother Jones or The Nation, and they were all in the bag for Hillary Clinton, which is weird, right? So that's why I think half the Democratic Party is still asleep to the horribleness and the Republicanism that has been infecting the Democratic Party. And that's why people are like, to me, uh, the Hillary Clinton campaign frustrated me in the exact same ways the George Bush administration frustrated me. Constant gaslighting, constant their apologies for their failures make things worse. Um, And so would you, I mean, that's, people don't realize that. Like that's still, they're not going to admit what the problem is. And that used to be the problem of the Republican Party. You remember after 2012, they did the autopsy on the Republican Party. And what did they find out? We have to do more outreach to Latina. And they just ignored everything that they said was wrong. They got lucky that their next opponent was Hillary Rodham Clinton. And everybody wanted to smash the establishment. But now the Democrats and the Republicans have their head buried in the sand. Hey, we're doing another live Jimmy Dore show the day after Christmas, December 26th. We're doing a live Jimmy Dore show in Burbank, California. Come see it. There's a link for tickets right there.